good day today? I had a really good day today, super productive, one of those days where you have like a list of things to do, and then you can look back at the end of the day and you actually got them done. It's like the opposite of those days where you have a list of things to do, and then somebody calls, and you get an email, you get a flat tire, and at the end of the day, nothing has got done. And you think, what did I accomplish today? Nothing. But I had the opposite of that today. Got a bunch done, feeling really good, and um, super looking forward to the presentation tonight. Actually, two, and uh, the first one is uh, titled, Who Was Right, Jesus or Darwin? And uh, it's a little bit of a provocative title, and it's purposefully provocative, but we're actually going to be going a direction that might be a little different than many people would assume. Uh, If you hear that title, Who Was Right, Jesus or Darwin?, the assumption might be that we'll be spending a lot of time talking about creation and evolution and the various evidences for and against those competing systems. In fact, we'll spend only a little bit of time on that. But what we are going to do tonight is we're going to paint a picture what are we going to do, everyone? We're going to paint a picture, and in painting a picture, we're going, to kind of, we're going to kind of ask the question, if Darwin was right, if Darwinism as a system, and we'll define that here in just a little bit, is correct, what kind of a world emerges from that? If he was right, what kind of a world would we expect? What, what would relationships look like? What would, what would society look like? What would the world look like? And then we're going to ask the opposite question. If Jesus was right... Uh, at least in my opinion, it's the opposite question. If Jesus was right, what would the world look like? What would relationships look like? What would meaning and purpose in life look like? And look like? And so our presentation tonight is who was right, Jesus or Darwin? And uh, maybe just very quickly by way of review, let me ask you a question and see if you've learned anything so far, uh, particularly with regards to this question. Is it good news that there is a God? I heard about a third of you give the correct answer, and uh, about two-thirds of you say yes. Um, But as we learned last night, it might be good news, right? It depends on what kind of a God we're talking about. Isn't that true? Um, If we're talking about the kind of God that wants us to huck virgins into volcanoes in order to appease his wrath, well, I'm not interested in that kind of God existing. In fact, given the choice between that God and atheism, I'll choose atheism. In fact, given the choice between most versions or permutations of God, I would say, no, no, I would much prefer a universe where that kind of God doesn't exist. But what we're trying to see, the picture that is emerging here, is that it's not just any ordinary God, not not any unworshipable or unlikable God that exists. In fact, Scripture reveals a picture of God that is profoundly beautiful. And last night we asked the question, who is God? But then we ask the secondary question, which is very important, and that is, does God exist? And and we looked at some very good evidences for the good reasons to believe that God exists. But we learned that we can we can more than just believe, we can, does anyone remember this? We can also we can know. That's right. We talked about the difference between knowing and showing. Well, there's going to be people that are going to hear these presentations and they're going to say, okay. Uh, I can resonate with that basic picture of God. God is love. And I can resonate with the idea that that God gives us both external evidence that corroborates our scientific experience, uh, our scientific evidence, but he also gives us internal experience. Um, But what about this whole evolution thing? What about the whole Charles Darwin thing? Didn't Charles Darwin and haven't subsequent scientific um, revelations basically proved that uh, Darwin was correct in his basic assessment of the world? And uh, I think the answer to that is, is positively not the case. It is not the case that he was correct. And I want to talk a little bit about that tonight, but that's not going to be the main focus of where we're going. I want to begin in kind of what might seem like a bit of an unusual way. I want to start by talking about this man here. Does anyone know who that is? Okay, that's Dr. Ben Carson. He is a retired neurosurgeon up until just recently. He was the director of several uh, neurosurgery uh, departments at Johns Hopkins University. And uh, he's, he's considered by many to be maybe the, the greatest modern neurosurgeon, maybe the greatest neurosurgeon of all time. In 1987, he performed a very courageous, very brave operation. It's what's called a hemispherectomy, in which he was able to, to disassociate or to, to remove the, the, the two halves of congenitally joined twins, Siamese twins. And uh, in this remarkable situation, and, and subsequent, after 1987, there were many others that uh, he was able to do. The twins actually lived. It was a very 
dangerous operation, and it was a remarkable uh, operation. And uh, not only uh, did, did uh, he perform the operation, but subsequent to that, many other amazing stories and testimonies. Uh, Dr. Ben Carson, who happens to be a, happens to be a devout Christian, uh, has written a book, and the book is titled uh, Gifted Hands, The Ben Carson Story. Uh, it's my understanding that the book has also been recently turned into a movie. Has anyone seen the movie? And uh, I think 2009, the movie came out. I know my children have seen it. I've not yet seen it. Um, but basically a remarkable story, sort of a rags-to-riches type story, but not a riches in terms of, of affluence or wealth, um, but, but just a story of, of from poverty to success and then really to, to amazing success, being at the very top of a highly competitive and uh, highly complex field, and that's neurosurgery. Um, well, anyway, a very interesting thing about Dr. Ben Carson, I was actually just recently with him in South Africa last month. Uh, he and I were the, the keynote speakers at an event, and it was really neat to meet him and meet his wife. His wife is an absolute cracker. She's a total character, completely hilarious, where Ben is a little more quiet, very kind of quiet and demure, but she was, man, she was an absolute card. Well, anyway, here's a very interesting thing. Earlier this year, in May of this year, Ben Carson was slated to speak at Emory University. Now, Emory University is a university in Atlanta. Uh, rated among the top 20 or 25 universities in the United States of America. It's a research university, about 20,000 students. And uh, Dr. Ben Carson had been asked to give the commencement speech at Emory University for the graduating seniors. And uh, he agreed to do that. He's given, oh, I suppose, many dozens of similar commencement speeches. And uh, in this particular case, it was very interesting because there was a group of faculty and staff and even some students at the university that actually protested Dr. Ben Carson's coming. Now, this is a bit of an interesting situation because not only is he academically renowned, he also has received uh, what's called the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest honor that can be bestowed upon a civilian in the United States of America. So he's really a top shelf kind of person. So it was a little unusual when in Emory University, uh, this sort of grassroots movement began to swell in which people were signing a petition, in excess of 500 students, fa faculty and staff signed a petition that said, we don't want this guy. We do not want this guy coming to deliver our commencement address. And uh, the reason was a very interesting one. And I'll just let you uh, read part of the, the document that was circulated. By the way, he did end up speaking. It was, I think, May 13th or 14th. He did end up speaking. The, the petition was ultimately unsuccessful. But what I want to do is sort of launch into our question tonight about who was right, Jesus or Darwin, by taking a look at the objection that was raised by the Emory University, uh, some of them, some of the students, faculty, and staff. And this is what it says. We are writing to call the attention of the Emory community to this year's commencement speaker's denial of, what is that word right there? Denial of evolution. Okay, so we're writing, we want everyone to know that this guy denies the basic Darwinian picture of the world, of the biological world. It goes on to say, Dr. Ben Carson is a world-renowned neurosurgeon who has advanced medicine and who has supported the education of countless children through his philanthropic organization. These accomplishments can provide a great inspiration to graduating Emory students, sort of the requisite, you know, politically correct pat on the back. Uh, but as those students, their families, and the Emory community listen to his speech, we ask you to also consider the enormous positive impact of science on our lives and how that science rests squarely on the shoulders of evolution. Now, if you're paying attention here, you'll notice that, that there's been a, a bit of a conflation here. It starts off, we don't want Dr. Ben Carson to be here because he doesn't believe in evolution, and then now they pull a bit of a fast one and say he's somehow anti-science. Well, of course, he's not anti-science. His entire career, both his educational career, his professional career, his academic career, is all built around. The man has published more than 100 uh, different papers in, scientifically, uh, in scientific journals, peer-reviewed medical journals. So the guy is clearly well aware of the scientific enterprise, but they pull a bit of a quick one there. They say, we're concerned about his denial of evolution, but we want the Emory community to know that we value science. 
as if science and evolution are absolutely synonymous. It goes on to say there, science rests squarely on the shoulders of evolution. Uh, that's a bit of uh, having the cart before the horse. Their actual claim should be that evolution rests squarely upon the shoulders of science, which I deny and I don't believe, but that's really what their claim should be. They continue uh, the article, or their, uh, their letter rather, their letter of protestation, it says, what is most deeply concerning about Dr. Carson's dismissal of evolution is that he equates the acceptance of evolution with a lack of ethics and morality. Now, this is very important. Look at what it says here. He states, ultimately, if you accept the evolutionary theory, you dismiss... What is that word there? Can you read that word? You dismiss ethics. And ethics in this context just means right behavior, morally sound behavior, morally upright behavior. He dismisses if, he says, if you accept the evolutionary theory, you dismiss ethics. You don't have to abide by a set of moral codes. This is quoting Carson. You determine your own conscience based on your own desires. Now, here's kind of the interesting thing. The primary objection was not just that, that Dr. Carson objected to the evolutionary theory in general, but that he actually went a step further and he said that evolution as a theory entails something larger. Evolution, what, what did I say there? Evolution entails something. And he basically said, well, by my understanding, if, if, if I understand Darwinian evolution correctly and I understand its basic presuppositions, if we affirm Darwinian evolution, the quotation we just had there, he says, if, then you, you dismiss ethics. And there is no moral code that would determine this is the right way to act, this is the wrong way to act, this is the moral way to act, this is the immoral way to act. Well, one of the things that we looked at in our presentation last night was sort of four good reasons to believe that God exists. I wonder if you remember what, what they were. Do you remember what the first one was? Time. time. Very good. We looked at the nature of time. The second one was life. Very good. The nature of life and the, the coding that required, is required in DNA and, and other structures to, to give us life. What was the third one? Mind, very good. We talked about uh, Einstein's observation that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe was precisely its comprehensibility. Not just that the universe is amazing, but there, that there are minds here to apprehend that the universe is amazing. And again, this ought to raise our suspicions. But what was the fourth one? Time, life, mind, ought. And we, we, we remarked that the word ought is a duty word. It's a responsibility word, right? If you ought to do something, you should do it. There's an obligation to do it. It's, it's the right thing to do. So what Carson is saying here is a very interesting thing. He's saying, if my understanding of evolutionary theory is correct, if we affirm basic Darwinian evolution, that entails something. Sort of imagine this, if you would, with me. Imagine that over here we have the, the biblical palette. And just, just imagine that you have paints of various colors and hues and shades, and we're going to paint onto a canvas. And over here, we have the Darwinian palette, and we have various hues and shades and colors, etc. And the Darwinian palette and the biblical palette are different palettes. And what we're going to sort of ask tonight is, if we start painting a picture with the, the Darwinian colors and the Darwinian palette, what kind of a picture emerges? What do I end up looking like? What do my relationships end up looking like? What does society end up looking like? And what does the world at large end up looking like? And then we're going to ask the other question. If we paint the world with the biblical picture, if, if scripture is to be believed, and these are our colors, these are our hues and shades, and we begin to paint here, what kind of a picture emerges here? What does it tell me about myself, about my relationships, about larger society and the world uh, beyond? And what, what Carson is saying here, and the thing that the uh, protesters at Emory were really sort of driving at, he is saying, if you accept evolution, it's as if, it's not as if the train just stops there. No, it entails something else. And in Carson's case, he's saying, it entails a breach of ethics. It entails a, a sort of... Um, a, a nebulosity with regards to, to right behavior and wrong behavior and moral codes and, and you can just do whatever you want. As he says, um, you determine your own conscience based on your own desires. Your own, what's that word, everyone? Desires. We're going to come back to that concept. So I want you to take that idea that you determine what's right and wrong based on your own desires. Take that idea and put it on a shelf because we'll come back to it almost at the end of the presentation. Now, let's just spend a little bit of time sort of talking about 
uh, what Darwinism is and who Charles Darwin was. We're not going to spend, this is not going to be an exhaustive treatment, but we do want to understand what we're talking about when we talk about Darwinian evolution. Charles Dar Darwin was born in England in 1809, and uh, unknown to many people, he actually went uh, to Cambridge to study for the Anglican priesthood. Uh, he was a, a Christian early on in his experience. He wanted to be a minister in the Church of England. And uh, he, though, became somewhat dissatisfied with religion, and understandably so, as we're going to see in our next presentation. Um, because the religion that, frankly, was, being, was, being, was on tap or was being served to him was not appealing. It wasn't biblical Christianity, I should say. It was ostensibly biblical Christianity, but in fact it wasn't. And so at the age of 22, in 1831, he was given the opportunity to take time off from his uh, studies at Cambridge and go on a naturalist voyage. And uh, he was a bit of a, well, you wouldn't call him an amateur naturalist, but he certainly was not yet a professional scientist, being just 22 years young. And uh, so he sailed on a ship called the HMS Beagle that left and uh, took a fairly straightforward journey, uh, I think down to Africa first and then across the Atlantic over to... Um, South America, around the southern tip of South America, and eventually arrives at sort of the, the seminal location, and that is the Galapagos Islands. And uh, over, particularly in the Galapagos Islands, Darwin began to make a series of observations, and uh, his observations, very interestingly, this will become very critical for us in our next presentation, um, his observations were sort of built around trying to understand the diversity of animal life that we see. And uh, eventually, uh, he, as he began to sort of systematize his observations in 1859, many years later, uh, he published uh, a book that is probably the single most influential science book of modern times called On the Origin of Species. And basically, the, the concept of, of evolution, Darwinian evolution, it rests on basically two fundamental ideas. Number one is common ancestry. That is to say that everything descended from a single common ancestor. You've probably seen in your biology textbooks, either in high school or college, the sort of tree of life, as it's called. And, you know, you have your, you know, early organisms that are very simple, you know, unicellular and then finally multicellular and then increasingly complex as the branches of the tree eventually extend out. And so you and I here are at the sort of apex of the tree, as it were. We're very complex. But whether you're talking about a cow or a human or a whale or whatever, all of us ultimately trace our ancestry back to a common unicellular biological ancestor. Okay, that's the first major principle of Darwinism. The second principle is how is that um, common ancestor, that very simple unicellular organism, how does it become increasingly complex? And Darwin basically had the idea that nature could select by virtue of even the slightest variation between this biological form and this biological form, nature could, uh, depending on the circumstance, whether it was wet, a wet season or a dry season or whatever, any little difference that this, say, uh, this population or this population had um, would give them perhaps a, a survival advantage in changing and varying circumstances. And over time, cumulatively, those mild changes would begin to produce populations that were increasingly successful uh, at, at, at surviving and at propagating their own species. And, and basically, the, on these two central tenets, Darwinism, Darwin created a mechanism that allowed people to believe... Um, basically that we were all descended from, from a common ancestor. Common ancestry, and uh, the second one is what we would call survival of the fittest, or natural selection. Now, a sort of interesting thing um, about this is that early on, as I've already mentioned here in Darwin's experience, uh, he was studying for the priesthood, and he had a very um, strong commitment to Scripture, a very strong commitment to Scripture. In fact, he wrote to a friend of his, when he had left to go on his journey, uh, he wrote to a friend of his who had remained at Cambridge to continue his studies in the priesthood, and he wrote, I dare hardly look forward to the future, for I do not know what will become of me. Right? I don't know what my future holds. You know, I'm sailing around the world. I'm an amateur naturalist. I don't know what the future holds. Little did he know he would go on to become, you know, arguably the single most significant figure in modern science. But here he's writing to his friend who's still studying for the ministry back at Cambridge, and he says, your situation is above envy. 
I do not venture to even frame such happy visions. Man, your life is so good. I, I can't even imagine my life being as good as yours. To a person fit to take the office, the life of a clergyman is a type of all that is, what does that say there? Of all that is respectable and happy. And so what we see here, um, and by all accounts, by the way, Charles Darwin was a fine gentleman and, and a, and a, and a, and a pleasant person to be around. But what we definitely see in his life, we'll talk more about this in our, in our next presentation, is a sort of drifting from his earlier moorings in Christianity. He, he had a belief in God, he had a belief in Scripture, he had a respect for the priesthood, but he began to observe things in the natural world. And frankly, the main thing that he observed was what he considered to be an excess of suffering. That's our next presentation, is on suffering. He just said, there's just so much suffering. And over time, as he ruminated on the biological world and, and uh, the, the, the various, uh, the excess of suffering that he saw and the various instances of suffering, he began to slowly, it didn't happen like overnight. No, no, no. It was a long process, taking probably, oh, half a decade or more, whereby he eventually left behind his earlier moorings in, in belief in God and in Christianity in particular. So uh, B. Warfield in 1888 wrote uh, a, a, bit a bit of an analysis of Darwin's experience, and he writes this. Thus the doctrine of evolution, once heartily adopted by him, once he really grasped it, gradually undermined his faith until he cast off the whole of Christianity as an unproved delusion. The process was neither rapid nor unopposed. In other words, it's not something he wanted to happen. He was still trying desperately at some level to cling to his faith, but he just felt as though he could not. He speaks of his unwillingness to give up his belief and of the slow rate at which unbelief crept over him, although it became at last complete. Now, I kind of want to remind us here of, of our two palettes. Over here we have the biblical palette. We're going to be painting a picture. And over here we have the Darwinian palette, and we're going to be painting a picture. Darwin, when he first began to make his initial observations in Galapagos and beyond, did not fully understand the ramifications of his own theory. He was just a young naturalist that was making various and sundry observations, and he began to put forward, at first tentatively, his idea of common ancestry and natural selection. Little did he know the trickle-down effect. What Ben Carson was saying is actually quite right that if this is true, it's not as though the train station just stops there. No, 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 no. If this is true, it entails things about the nature of human beings, about the nature of reality, about the nature of biology, about the nature of God. It's a little bit like this. Several years ago, I went fishing with my son, and uh, we were on a boat. And um, uh, it's quite an interesting little story, and I'll tell a very quick version of it. We were on a, a, one of those pontoon boats, and we were fishing off the front of the, we were fishing off the back of the boat, but at the front of the boat there was a, a great big anchor, and the, the anchor rope was all sort of twirled around on the deck. It wasn't our boat, we were borrowing it from the local camp. And uh, we were driving the boat around to different places and sort of parking the boat, and then we'd put the anchor in, and we'd, you know, try to catch some fish there, and then we'd go to the next place, we'd pull the anchor up rather, go to the next place, put the anchor down. Well, my son was sort of seeing this, he was a young man, probably five or six, my oldest, and he's observing what dad is doing. So we get to one particular place, and um, without, you know, just without having asked or, or, or without me having asked him to do it, um, he went and he grabbed the anchor with all of his, you know, five or six-year-old might, and he, he threw it in. Well, the problem was is that he didn't, he wasn't thinking to be sure that the anchor rope was clear, that there was nothing tangled up with the anchor rope. Well, in this particular case, I had set... You know, my fishing rod was on the anchor rope, and, and uh, he himself was standing, you know, sort of halfway tangled in the anchor rope, and uh, our lunch was there, and uh, I think there was like a jacket or something, which, you know, normally you'd pick those things up, you set them off, then you put the anchor in, but he, he wasn't thinking. So he takes the anchor, and he throws it in, and as the anchor begins to go, it was deeper than the other places we'd been, which had maybe 20 or 30 feet deep. This was beyond that. So as the, as the anchor begins to go down, bloop, all of a sudden, the, the fishing rod is like, boom, goes shooting off, right? Because the anchor rope was around it. And then I'm like, whoa, because I hear the splash. I'm at the back of the boat, and I hear the splash. I'm like, what? And I think my son has fallen in, but I see he's throwing the anchor rope in. Well, all I can see is that the anchor rope is around, like, his leg. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. Explain this one to my wife. So 
I, I run over, and I, I, as the rope is going down, phoom, there goes the jacket, phoom, there goes the lunch, and I, I quickly just lift him up. And then the anchor sort of, you know, harmlessly phoom, phoom, eventually goes down. And I'm like, Landon, you got to be careful. When you throw an anchor over like that, if there is stuff attached to that rope, it is going to be affected. You could have been pulled down. Okay, this is very similar to the situation with, with Darwinism. If you take and throw the anchor in, it's not as though the train just stops here and that it doesn't entail anything. No, there are huge entailments if Darwinism is true with regards to ethics and morality. That was Ben Carson's point. Ben Carson says, well, the way that I think about it, the way that I look at it, if this evolutionary theory is true, it sort of seems like you can just decide what you want based on your own desires, what you want. Right? And so think about that when you think about people say, oh, you know, I don't need God or, you know, evolution is true or whatever. That's like throwing the anchor over. Hey, that's fine. You're welcome to throw the anchor over. But you should be aware of just exactly what that anchor goes through because you don't just get rid of the anchor. You get rid of anything else that's tied up and tangled up with that rope. Does this make sense? That's Carson's point, And it's the point we're going to make tonight. As we begin to paint with this picture, we have colors that are available to us in the biblical picture that just are not available in the Darwinian picture. They're not. Things like love and values and, and ethics and, and moral codes. So the picture that we're going to paint is going to be a very different picture. We've been building on our what? What's this called here? The table of truth. And, and we took that first and normative and non-negotiable truth, and we placed it on the table of truth. What was that thing? What was this? It's the truth that, say it with me, three words, that God is love. Very good. And every subsequent truth or every other truth that is brought to the table, whatever those truths might be, as we sort of begin to cobble them together, we compare them to this truth. And if we see inconsistency between the truth that God is love and any other thing, like, let's just take Darwinian evolution. There are well-meaning Christian people who think you can affirm at the same time the fact that God is love and the biblical narrative and that God created through some Darwinian means, through some evolutionary means. Now, I really disagree because the picture that emerges if, if evolution is true is one in which God is creating through a means in which Hundreds of thousands, no millions of generations of sentient beings are essentially wasted. Furthermore, it means that death actually precedes sin. And what kind of a God creates that way in such a wasteful and, and a prodigal way? It just doesn't make sense. So if somebody says to me, oh, no, 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 you can affirm, you know, as, as many in the evangelical and the Catholic world do, oh, no, you can keep the Bible and you can keep evolution. And so they want to bring that truth to the table. But here I'm faced with a dilemma because I cannot square this basic idea with the truth that God is love. I don't think they can either, by the way. It creates an... an, an a situation of absolute cognitive dissonance and, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? An antithetical situation where you have to choose between this or this. And for me, that's an easy choice. This truth, the central truth about who and what God is, that God is love, never comes off the table. It what, everyone? It never comes off the table. You need to say that with a little more enthusiasm than that. The central truth that God is love, say it with me, never comes off the table. And if we see an inconsistency or an incongruency with any other religious teaching or any other kind of teaching, if we can't keep that on the table and that, that whatever the other thing is always comes off. Well, sort of back to the two palettes here, the Darwinian palette, that's, excuse me, the biblical palette, and the Darwinian palette, what we're going to see here is a very interesting thing. We're going to quote several sort of Darwinians, uh, people that is people who, scientists who believe in evolution, and we're going to sort of see the picture that emerges. What does this painting look like? Cornelius Hunter, in his very interesting little book, Darwin's God, writes, evolution is more than just a what kind of theory? Scientific. There's more than a scientific theory. Well, in what way? Well, in this way if only because of its tremendous influence in areas outside of science, okay? It is probably the most influential idea ever generated by science. Now, that's arguable. 
But the point he's making is a good one. You could probably say Newtonian physics would be at least, or even Einsteinian special and general relativity would be at least as significant. But, but his point is a, is a great one, and that is that in the grand scheme of scientific theories that have, that have been put forward in the last 500 years, Darwinism is going to be in the top three for most influential. And it's true. Because it started off as basically a biological theory, but now there's evolutionary psychology, there's evolutionary sociology, there's evolutionary anthropology, there's evolution... I mean, there's even evolutionary cosmology, if you can believe it. I mean, it just... There's evolutionary theology, and to me, that's just a complete oxymoron, but, that, oxymoron, but that's beside the point. The idea here is that it begins to put it, its tentacles, this idea um, begins to put its tentacles into everything. And you say, well, what's the idea? Well, the fundamental idea is the idea of self-centeredness, self-preservation, or, to put it very succinctly, selfishness, right? Self-centeredness is the primary color that you're going to be painting in the Darwinian palette. Self-centeredness, me. What I want to try and do tonight is we paint these two pictures. At the end, we're going to ask which one of these agrees with you at your most emotional, at your gut level. What does your gut tell you? That, that, that the palette is constructed primarily of selfishness, self-preservation, and self-centeredness? Is that what the world is about? Or is the world about something more magnanimous, more beautiful, and more moral than that? Is it about love and other-centeredness and, and this great truth that God is love and greater love has no man than this that a man would lay down his life for his friends? The point that Hunter is making here is a fantastic one. He's basically saying the reason that evolution is so widely influential is that it went outside of the original areas of science and biology and has crept even into morals and ethics. Now, nowhere is this clearer than in uh, this particular statement by Dr. William Provine, who is a, um, oh, I think he might be, I don't maybe he's an ornithologist. It'll, I think it'll be on the second slide. But anyway, he it was Cornell University. And he writes this. He said this in the, uh, uh, the Darwin Day lecture, I think, 1988. He said, naturalistic evolution, which is just another way of saying atheistic evolution, without God. Natur naturalistic evolution has clear consequences that Darwin, Charles Darwin understood perfectly. Number one, no gods worth having exist. By the way, I agree with that. If Darwinian evolution is true, I would not be interested in any god that would participate in a process like that. I disagree that it is true, but if it was true, I'm not interested. Don't sign me up for any kind of a god that would use that sort of a process. That's my personal perspective. He goes on to say, no life after death exists. Number three, no ultimate foundation for ethics exists. Now, what does that sound like? What does that... Does, have we heard any other quotation tonight? Have we heard anybody else say that basic idea... Ben Car that was Ben Carson's point. And isn't it funny that Emory University was like, no, we can't have this guy come because he's saying that if you affirm evolution, you deny a foundation for ethics. But here, William Provine, who is himself a Darwinian evolutionist, is saying the very thing that Ben Carson was raked over the coals at Emory for saying. In other words, rather than just being politically correct, Carson was saying what was true, and so too was Provine, and it's one of the things I appreciate about honest evolutionists like this. They're not sort of trying to soft pedal what they believe and sort of keep a little bit of Christianity in it, and, you know, we don't. No, let's just be honest. If that's the way the universe looks, I want to know, right? So don't soft pedal it to me. Don't make me feel good so I can go to bed at night. No, I want to know what the truth is. You with me on that? And so I appreciate Provine for saying that. Number four, no ultimate meaning in life exists. And he says human free will is non-existent. So I want you to hear what, what Provine is saying. He's saying if evolution is true, it entails these kinds of things. There's no God. There's no life after death. There's no ground for ethics. There's no human free will, etc. Now, it gets, it gets even interesting. This is the statement from Ben Carson, which you already you picked up on that immediately. You know, ultimately, if, if you accept evolutionary theory, you dismiss ethics. That was Carson's basic point. Now, it gets even more interesting, more terrible, I would say. Um, not only... Uh, okay, let me just sort of back up here a little bit. Charles Darwin basically put forward the idea of a species-level evolution, the idea that, that evolution was selecting at the species level... Uh, but years later, I think 1972, uh, Richard da Dawkins wrote a book. Uh, Richard Dawkins, of course, is a well-known atheist today. But at the time, in 1972, he wrote a book, a very interesting book, called The Selfish Gene. We're going to get to that in just a second. 
And basically his idea was that evolution is actually acting not primarily at the level of the species, but it's acting even at the genetic level. Okay, now let me sort of unpack that here. This is a quotation here from, um, I think this is Francis Crick. The universe is nothing but a collection of atoms in motion. Human beings are simply, what is that word right there? Simply machines. Now look at this, for the propagating of DNA. For, for propagating DNA, and the propagation of DNA is a self-sustaining process. It is every living object's sole reason for living. Now this is where things get really interesting. Basically, you are just a machine that's being utilized, as it were, by DNA to propagate itself. So what, what Dawkins did is he took, the Dar he took Darwin a step further. Darwin said evolution is happening at the species level. Dawkins said more than 100 years later, no, 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 it's happening at the genetic level. And he says it's really all about a gene-centric view of evolution. Now, hang on here. This is why this is so significant. You might be sitting there thinking, am I in science class again? Well, uh, okay, but you have to understand the point. What Dawkins is saying is, is actually very fascinating. He's saying that reality at its most basic, fundamental, rudimentary level is selfish. It's all about my DNA wanting to propagate itself, and even me as a human being is really beside the point. There is, it, I'm just a machine, as it were, that's being utilized to propagate DNA. And your DNA, now of course we can't actually say that it's selfish because that implies a moral concept. But the idea here is that basically the universe at its most core, the biological life at its core, is not about other-centeredness and love and grace and, and forgiveness and all blah, 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 all of that virtuous ethical stuff. No, it's about me. And it's about my DNA, and it's about my descendants, and it's about my survival, and anybody who threatens that, right, is going to have to wrestle with me. Now, as if this is not, uh, this is the book, uh, The Selfish Gene, 1972, I think he uh, wrote it. And uh, it was really a revolutionary concept and a revolutionary book. Um, Michael Roos, a professor of biology at Florida State University, writes, ethics, there it is again, right behavior... That's what we're asking. We're going to paint the picture here with the Darwinian palette. Okay? And over here, we're going to paint the picture with the, with the biblical palette. What, what kind of a picture are we going to end up with here? Roos says ethics, that is right behavior, moral behavior, as we understand it, is an illusion, look at this, fobbed off on us by our genes to get us to cooperate. So this whole, I'll be nice to you and you'll be nice to me, there's really no value, inherent value in, in, what did Jesus say? Do unto others as you would what? Have them do unto you. Right? This idea that, that, that the whole of, of Scripture is based on, this basic idea that love is the grand and beautiful virtue, that, that Jesus was asked on one occasion, hey, what's the great commandment in the law? And Jesus is like, oh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is very similar to it. You shall, do you know this? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, if Darwinian evolution is true, that's just a bunch of blah, 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 blah. There's no point to it. What Roos is saying, what, what Dawkins is saying, is that this whole concept is just, just an illusion to be nice, to be gracious, to be kind, to be magnanimous. So look at, look at the picture that's emerging here, right? The paragons of virtue in the world, the, the Mother Teresas, the Martin Luther King Juniors, the Mahanda Gandhis, the Jesus Christ, all of these, these paragons of virtue from different religious systems and different... Pers right? The whole thing is an illusion fobbed off on us by our DNA just to get us as machines to cooperate, right? It's almost like something out of a science fiction movie, right? How many science fiction movies have been built around the idea that we are really just, you know, like being harvested by machines, you know, human beings are really being controlled by machines and we're being harvested for our energy or our brains or our life force or whatever, blah, 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 blah. The point is, is that this is the picture of reality that we're being told. Except the machines are not these big, you know, mechanical devices. They're micro-machines. They're the DNA that make you, you, and me, me. Right? It's a very dire... You, if, you're, if you're thinking about this color, I mean, if you're thinking about this picture, all of the blues, in my opinion, the blues are gone, the yellows are gone, the reds are gone, the, 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 that cornucopia of color is gone. We're dealing now with blacks and grays, and mainly just blacks. Yeah. Right? But over here, 
where we still retain the idea of, of love and of kindness and of goodness and of other-centeredness. And, and we, have this, we have a whole palette here. It's like Photoshop. We can begin to paint a picture. Beautiful picture. Glorious picture. Um, this is Francis Crick, who, as we mentioned yesterday, won the Nobel Prize in 1962 for his co-discovery of the DNA molecule. You, you. You, this person that you are, you, your joys and your sorrows and your memories and ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will, right? That gets back to what Provine said. You don't have any free will. <laughs> Come on. Are no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. Well, now another thing has happened. Not only is there no ground for ethics, not only is there no ground for right behavior in this palette over here, you don't even have an identity. You don't even possess a personhood. You are just, to use Crick's words, a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. There is no you. When you look in the mirror and, and you have a sense of personhood, a sense of identity, a sense of who you are, you can disabuse your mind of that right now if Darwinian evolution is true. There is no you. It's an illusion being fobbed, on you, fobbed off on you by a very complex organ located in your head called the brain. Right? So you'll just notice that... that Color after color after color after color is being removed from this palette, and we're being left with a very stark, I would say very dire, very dis despair-inducing picture of life. But those are the colors available to us, and we should be honest with what the picture looks like. See, tonight when we ask the question, who was right, Jesus or Darwin, we're not saying, well, here's the evidence for evolution, and here's the evidence for creation. There is very good evolution, uh, evidence rather, for believing in the, the biblical creation account. That's not what we're talking about tonight. What we're talking about tonight is, let's just pretend for, for um, uh, argument's sake that this is true. What kind of a picture of reality emerges from that? And I tell you, it is terrible. It's despair-inducing. It is, it is completely, totally unlivable. You, your identity, your personhood, your relationships, your love with your spouse for your children, your, it's just, it just all it just evaporates into some self-centered, self-sustaining, self-preserving process whereby you um, are really not what you think you are. No. You're a machine, as it were, being utilized by DNA for self-propagation. It's just pathetic. And at its most fundamental core, it's selfishness, right? And over here, the picture that emerges, though, is this. What is this, everyone here? What does it say? God is love. So over here, the most fundamental truth about the universe, the universe at its most basic, at its most fundamental, at its most rudimentary, is this other-centeredness. This, this giving to others, this extending to others. In fact, let me just show you a text in Scripture. It's one of my favorites. Um, th this phrase is a Paul, and uh, uh, this is a phrase that Paul just cannot get away from. And we're, we're going to look at this in a, tomorrow. Actually, we're going to spend quite a lot of time on this phrase. Um, but let's just go to Ephesians chapter five, just very quickly here, and I'll just quote this for you, or read it for you. In Ephesians chapter five, Paul says a very interesting thing. He says in verse one. Speaking to, to the uh, believers in Ephesus, he says, he says, Therefore, as dear children, be imitators of God. Imitate God. And it's very interesting. That's verse 1. The first thing that comes to Paul's mind when he exhorts the believers in Ephesus, Hey, act like God. Imitate God. What is the first, the first four words of verse 2? And walk in what? Love. Don't miss that. Paul says... Act like God, imitate God, be like children imitating their parents. And the first, you can almost feel him thinking. The first thing that comes to his active apostolic mind, well, if you're going to imitate God, a God who is, what is it, everyone? A God who is love. Then the first thing that he's going to say is, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. Now watch this, as Christ also has loved us and given himself given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. That phrase for Paul is an inescapable phrase. He can't stop saying it. We'll look at that tomorrow. But he says it over and over again. Who gave himself, who gave himself, who gave himself. In fact, you're still there in Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse 25. Ephesians 5 verse 25. Here's a moral standard. Here's a, a code of ethics. Verse 25. Husbands, do you know this? Husbands what? Love your wives, now watch this, 
Why? Why should I love my wife? Why? That's a, that's a moral code. That's a, that's a standard of conduct. That's an, that's an ethical uh, uh, a prescription. Why should I do that? Look at what he says. Husbands, love your wives as or because Christ also, what did he do? Love the church. Now look at the very next bit. It says, because Christ also loved the church and what did he do? He gave himself. That's what love is. Love is not looking out for itself. Love is not self-preserving. It's not self-interested. We, we talked about that last night. There in the, the, the chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, love seeks not its own. Love is not looking out for its own interests, its own desires, its own hopes, its own dreams, its own wants. The whole concept of love is that it's giving. No, 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 it's you. It's, it's your desires. It's your wants. It's your dreams. It's your hopes. It, love is giving itself. In fact, the best known verse in all of Scripture. You know this. Best known verse in all of Scripture, John 3, 16. For God so loved that he, what, what does love do? That he gave. That's the point. You love, you give. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself. Be imitators of God as your children and walk in love just as Christ also loved us and gave himself. He gave, he gave, he gave. You, no, it's about you. No, 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 it's you, 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 you. It's deferring. It's giving. It's extending. It's a totally different picture of reality. We're painting now. Right? The picture that we're painting here is a wildly different picture, and that's the point. At the end, you can choose. You choose based on what your gut tells you. But over here, we've got a totally different palette, and that's the point. That was Ben Carson's point, and it's my point. Over here, we're like, I guess we'll use black again. <laughs> Maybe we'll throw in a little black. <laughs> right? I mean, there's just uh, no God, no identity. No personhood, no free will, no grounds for ethics, no life after death, just black. And then we'll throw some black on it. Are we getting, is the picture emerging here? Yes or no? Okay, good. Because if it's not, I, there's nothing I can do to make it emerge more than this. <laughs> Look at what Peter Atkins says. He says, science has no need of purpose. All the, ex this is a great statement. I just love it for, it's, it's, it's just bald Honesty. His, I think he's completely mistaken. I think he's frankly out to lunch, but I appreciate his honesty. All the extraordinary, wonderful richness of the world can be expressed as growth, look at this, from the dunghill of purposeless interconnected corruption. He's like, yeah, that's basically life. Life is a complicated thing that's growing from the dunghill of atoms and biological structures. Isn't that a great picture of life? It's a great big pile of dung, right? I mean, Hallmark is going to have a tough time with this. It's going to get really difficult. I mean, weddings are going to change, right? I mean, what are you going to say? It's nice to meet you on this pile of dung. I mean, what are you going to say? Everything breaks down. No God, no meaning, no ground for ethics, no free will, no personal identity, no genuine relationality, and no wonderful richness of the world. But we know that this isn't true. In our heart of hearts, and here's the interesting thing, even these scientists, and I respect them as human beings, but even these scientists cannot live the things that they say and publish in, and by the way, not all scientists are this way. I want to make that very clear. This is not an anti-science presentation. This is an anti-scientism presentation. Scientism is a totally different thing. It's a religion. And this is, basically, you can go into a classroom and say, do, 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 It's all purposeless, interconnected dunghill. But let me tell you, when that scientist goes home, I, I am quite sure he doesn't speak to his wife that way. If that scientist has a child that's killed in a car accident, or worse yet, taken and, and raped by a, by a you know, terrible person, he, he, is not, he or she is not indifferent about it. No. No, 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 no. When their child does something good, a sense of happiness and pride and, and meaning begins to well up within them. And when they're wronged, you know, heaven forbid, their child is kidnapped and raped or dies in a car accident or something, a sense of justice and of anger. The point is that you can't live that other life. This painting is totally unlivable. You can profess to believe it and you can write it on chalkboards in universities all day long, but you can't live this. 
I mean, what do you say at wedding ceremonies? What do you say to your children? What, what, how, do we, how do we value the Martin Luther King Juniors and, and the Martin Luthers, for that matter, of the world? How do we hold anybody in estimation for their virtuous, brave, courageous stand for principle? How, and the other side is also true. How do you punish a criminal? Right? I mean, if there is no vice and there is no virtue and there is no free will, what, why are our prisons populated with people that we think should best be kept away from? No, the whole thing goes to hell in a handbasket, literally. When you throw that anchor over, right? It doesn't just go nicely, innocuously, harmlessly into the deep. No. Life as you know it completely disappears. Life as you know it is completely gone, and that's why there is a fundamental incompatibility between this idea of what Jesus said was the truth about the nature of reality and what, what Darwin said. We're dealing either with, at its rock bottom, selflessness or selfishness, and these two things are perfectly incompatible. They're square circles. We know when we go to a wedding and we, and we, we see a beautiful... We just know intuitively, inherently, in, in, incorrigibly, there's something beautiful here. You hold a little baby. Come on. You know there's something significant happening there. You set your eye on your lover, the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with. You know something's happening there. Even the non-believer senses that there's some transcendent meaning. Something. Something beautiful, something wonderful. And it's not the mere interconnectedness on some proverbial dunghill. No, it's beautiful. It really is special. A beautiful sunset. I just spent time in Africa recently with my family. And let me tell you, you see those animals and they're amazing. You see an elephant. I mean, an ele whoa, whoa. clearly God has a sense of humor. I mean, look at the thing. It has a nose that's like four feet long that grabs the... It's like, what is that? Its ears are, ah, who would have invented that? I mean, it's just beautiful, and it's beautiful, right? One of the great experiences of my life was to be off the um, east coast of the South Island of New Zealand and jump in the water with hundreds, no, thousands of, of dolphins swimming all around me. Just, just to swim with the, ah, it was amazing. My wife's getting pictures. I'm like, maybe come in. She's like, no, I'm good. I mean, I'm just like, no, they're, they're fun. Ah, you're swimming. You can't tell me there's not something beautiful there. You lay out under the stars and you look up and you have that sense of grandeur and of beauty and you feel really small. You know something's up. You know it's up. You see it. You walk into your, head, or you walk into your house and you smell fresh bread. Oh, you're like, oh, yeah, something's up. A good meal. You sit down with your friends and you, uh, life, it just, <laughs> there's something about this thing called life, a beautiful thing, and it's awesome and it's glorious. And that picture, that picture, that mental picture that you have of life, and I'm not saying it's all fun and good. We're going to talk about that in our next presentation. You know, why do innocent children suffer? But the point is this, life at its best, you sense that there's meaning, you sense that there's significance, you sense that it is pregnant with God's intentionality. And yet all of that is gone if this is all that we've got to work with. We clear on this, everyone? Okay, I want to I get here to this uh, amazing presentation. August 2, 2005, this, or this amazing story. August 2, 2005, Air France Flight 350 was preparing to land at Pearson International Airport in Toronto. The problem was they missed the runway. They overshot the runway and... Uh, the, the, the plane went off the end of the runway and, and just was within flame, was in flames within moments. In fact, the, the wreck was so bad and so obviously uh, uh, catastrophic that the Canadian uh, de, uh, de, uh, Minister of Transportation actually offered her condolences for those that had lost their lives in the flight. The remarkable thing was is that unbeknownst to her and even to many people who were at the airport, no one lost their life, and here's why. An amazing thing happened. As, as people saw, you can see this freeway that's just kind of behind over there. There's a main road over there. As, as people saw the plane miss the runway, they pulled their cars over. They, oh, what is that? And people, by the dozens, start pulling their cars over. They get out of their cars. And now check this out. They went racing toward a flaming canister, namely a plane, full of jet fuel. What, 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 what in the world? 
Why would they do that? Because there's people in there. They, want, they went to help. They went to what? They wanted to help. They, they, they go running at the other, at the plane. And look at that. I mean, that's not, if you saw that, how many people survived? You'd say nobody survived. Come on, look at that. Nobody survived that. Everybody survived. And the reason that every single person survived, was it just ordinary people were drunk? Those people need our help. And people start racing over to help other people. They don't know these people. These are not their brothers, their sisters, their mother. They, who are these people? In a Darwinian world over here, there is no good explanation as to why you would go out of your way to help somebody that's not... Who are they? No, 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 no. In fact, the virtuous thing to do would be to let... Yeah, survival of the fittest. Shouldn't have taken that flight. <laughs> right? But we, we know that's not right. We know in our soul, we, we just know that, that that's not right. And so people began to race. People began to rush to the crash site. Are these people heroes? What do you think? Did they do the right thing? Did they do the moral thing? Did they do the ethical thing? Did they do the thing that you would want them to do? Do you know why? Because you sense and we all sense in our innermost being, we you can almost taste it. You can feel it. It's tangible. You just know that the universe is wired that way, that the universe is better and life is better and your family is better and society is better when people are not only looking out for their own interests and their own desires and their own family and their own needs. We know that life is at its best when it's not about me. It's, hey, what can I, can I? It's the extended hand. It's the helpful posture. Yeah? Yeah? Look at what Mark Stein wrote. This is amazing. Eyewitnesses, uh, two days later in the, in, the, uh, in the local newspaper. Eyewitnesses' accounts vary. Some people are said to have panicked. Others to have stayed calm. Passing motorists pulled off on the road and hurried toward the burning jet. There, that is perfectly inexplicable. Run toward a burning jet? That is the most anti-Darwinian thing you can imagine. Hurried toward the burning jet to help any survivors. Of the eight emergency exits, two were deemed unsafe to use and and on a third and a fourth, the slides didn't work. So they only had four exits that were operable. Nonetheless, in a chaotic situation, hundreds of strangers coordinated sufficiently to evacuate a small space through four exits in less than a couple of minutes before the Airbus was consumed by flames. Is this awesome or what? It's awesome, it's beautiful, it's grand, it's glory, and it's godly. That's the point. When Paul wrote, he said, imitate God. Life is at its best. Life is at its most beautiful when you're imitating God. How do I imitate God? Oh. Walk in love. Greater love has no man than this. And a man would go running toward a burning canister to lay down his life for his friends. And beloved, that's the picture that emerges if this is true. God is love. And look at this painting. It's beautiful. It's glorious. There's meaning. There's hope. There's identity. There's personhood. There's, there's a future. There's free will. It's just... And over here, what we have nothing. It's blackness. There's no picture. Beloved, I, I implore you to hear the differing perspective, to hear who was right, Jesus or Darwin, not just on an evidence as for and against creation, but, but, but hear this. This is the picture. This is the picture. And, and what does your gut tell you? What does your soul tell you is true about reality at its most rock bottom? That it's selfish or selfless?